I don't know if anybody's joined us yet, but I will go ahead and say hello. Welcome back to another edition of Zach Gets Really Sweaty on Camera and Pretends to Know How to Make Barbecue. Well, hello, one viewer. Welcome. We'll give people a couple more minutes, which is good because I could use a couple more minutes to grab the things. Did I just lose everybody? Kim is watching and she is sitting on the front porch. Hi. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, before I give everyone seasickness, let me fix my beard here. Thank you guys for joining me again um, for another session of barbecue uh, how to, barbecue, barbecue tutorial. I don't know. Barbecue with Zach. That's the creative, fancy name that I'm going to come up with. And right now it's just me and my wife, and that's kind of sad and depressing but you know what we're gonna keep keep going on with the getting on anyway um it's warm so i'm gonna get started ribs take a while so if you're watching this on replay um that's why we went and got started without you anyway i'm gonna turn this around quarantine cue <laughs> thank you for making me feel better about myself and my non-existent audience so hey we got two people now it's me my wife and somebody else anyway we're gonna go ahead and get started um well, I guess I'll give people a couple more minutes because this is kind of sad that it's just the two of us. This is my smoker. Well, this is actually my grill that we're going to use as my smoker. While we're waiting, I'm going to go get something else to drink. Since there's two people, we'll give folks a couple more minutes to, uh, to join us. And I'm going to get something to drink. How are the kids doing out front, wife? Not good, maybe good, I don't know. Anyway, um, hey, we had a couple more people, that's good enough for me. Uh, welcome again to uh, barbecue time. Last time we did a turkey, this time we're gonna do ribs. But before we get started with the ribs, we are going to start with this setup. I had several people ask me what my setup was. Hi Dean, how are you? Um, this is, Ellie is making art, that's good. This is what I use. Um, Oh, there's two things I use. So this is the thing, it's under cover now that we used last time to smoke the turkey. Um, but this is the setup that I recommend for folks, especially if you're just doing barbecue for the first time and you don't want to spend a whole bunch of money. This is a really great way to get a great rig that doesn't cost a whole bunch of money. So this is called the Weber Performer. It's just your typical old as a, hey, there we go, the connection. We're going to be using it as a smoker, but obviously it works as a grill, so you get two for one with this setup. And it's got a nice table over here, which is really great for setting stuff down, um, pulling meat off and anything you can imagine um, it's a little bit more than just the regular Weber kettle if you get the most basic Weber kettle kettle you're looking at about a hundred bucks this thing is about 200 bucks um, but you get two extra features with it you get this thing down here at the bottom that silver pan that is holding in the ash and it keeps it gets all the ash that comes off your charcoals that goes uh, funnels it straight into that little bucket at the bottom which is really nice uh, for cleanup but also for safety and get her done that's what we're trying to do it's warm I hope the weather in California is nice um, anyway, so this is great because it's got that little um, ash catcher and then it's got this table over here, which we said was really good. Anyway, so this is my basic setup when I'm just doing something simple like a rack of ribs, um, you know, or if I'm grilling or, or whatever, but this is a really good setup for home. What you see on the left is uh, the uh, charcoals that are getting started in a chimney. Um, you can get a chimney just about anywhere and they come in all kinds of makes and models. This is the one that I've settled on that I like the, the best. It's made by a company called Oklahoma charcoal in there um, at a time. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I don't lose the internet. And then this is the uh, basket that I talked about, I think last time, it's called a slow and sear. And essentially what it is, is just a metal basket for charcoal. But if you can see, it creates uh, indirect cooking really easily. Indirect cooking is what you're gonna use for a barbecue um, or any kind of slow roasting that you wanna do. Indirect just means that you've got the heat on one side um, and you've got uh, your food cooking indirectly um, on the other so if we were grilling that would be direct heat and what's really cool about this slow and sear is that you can fill that up with all burning coals and it funnels the heat straight up in the air and gets a really 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 high heat for making a nice really um good sear on a steak so what you should do with your steak anyway is um, what's called a reverse sear and that's when you slow cook it to temperature on indirect heat and then sear it at the end there's the myth about searing a steak and locking the juices um, at the beginning that's nonsense the problem with that too is that when you start searing at the beginning you start cooking that steak and so you only get a if you're looking for like a let's say a medium or a medium rare as the lord intended you want a nice uh red center but if you start searing at the beginning you're just going to have a small red center if you do 
do a reverse sear, bring it up to temperature on indirect heat, sear at the end, and you can get that nice red center edge to edge, which is really great. Anyway, but we're not grilling today, we're smoking. And so um, I went ahead and cheated and got our charcoal started. Um, and we're gonna use what's called a, a snake technique. I actually usually do it a little bit differently, but this is the uh, more accurate technique. And I figure if I'm teaching people, you should learn how to do it accurately. So this is a snake technique. And what we're doing is trying to talk louder than that guy cutting his grass over there. Um, you're gonna put your um, burning charcoals in a snake pattern in a straight line. Um, that's gonna go around this edge, just like this, to make sure that we get um, our charcoals burning, but we don't want them all to burn at the same time. So if you notice, I've got um, about uh, a dozen or so charcoals, I actually have an exact number and I can tell you, um, that are on fire, already burnt. They've got that nice white ash around them. And then the rest of the basket is not burnt. And the reason for that is one, we don't want a really high temperature. Um, and two, we want these coals to cook down slowly so we don't burn through them. Because we're gonna be cooking for three hours um, with these ribs, maybe even just a little bit more depending on how moody they are today. Um, but this snake model is great because it winds its way around just like a snake and is gonna slowly burn down those charcoals underneath. Now, like I said, I know exactly how many charcoals I, I, uh, I put in there at the beginning. And that's not an accident. Um, actually, let's not look at my ugly face yet. Let's look back here. The great thing about these standard uh, charcoals and why I highly recommend using the uh, Kingsford good old blue bag is that they're all the same size and, and consistency and control are things that you really, really need. They're really, really important in barbecue um, because if your temperature goes up and down too fast, especially on like a brisket, it can really screw up the cooking time. What's great about this is you know exactly how much um, uh, heat that you're giving to the fire. So I have 17 charcoals uh, in there that are on fire. Just from experience, I know that's about how many I need to get to the temperature that I wanna get. So we've got those on. We're gonna grab this. This is just the grilled grape. We're gonna toss this over. If you're buying a grilled grape um, separately or if you need to replace one, I highly recommend getting one that has one of these uh, nice opening uh, size but one that opens up on the side it's great because it gives you access to add more coals and then when we want to put wood in you can put wood in there super easily without having to uh to lift the whole grate up and making a big mess anyway so we've got our charcoal going um next thing we're going to do is we need to know what temperature the pretty much single most important thing that you can uh or that you need to be in control of and you need to be aware of is the temperature now if you get a weber or really just about any smoker, you're gonna get a temperature gauge on top. Um, those aren't bad thermometers in and of themselves. The problem is those thermometers are measuring temperature up here, but our meat is cooking down here on the grate. And so we need to know what temperature it is on the grate, not up here. And if your thermometer is way up here, you're not gonna get an accurate temperature. So what we do is we get a separate thermometer. This is a, a brand that I mentioned last time that we were on called, uh, a company called Thermoworks, and this is their smoke thermometer. I really like it because one, it's got magnets, magnets on the bottom, so it sticks on here really well. Hello from New Jersey. Hey, New Jersey. Um, I really like this. One, most importantly, the thermometer is super, super highly accurate. Um, secondly, it is really, really easy to use, so I can set temperatures. If you look at the top, the 250 and 220 is a range, so it'll give me an alarm if it gets below or above those temperatures. And then it's got two probes, so I can put a probe for the temperature that I want in the grill, and then I can also put one in the meat. But with when it comes to when it comes to ribs, we're not gonna be using a thermometer inside the meat because you got too many bones. And if your thermometer is too close to the bones, it's gonna throw off the temperature. So we're gonna put our little clip in here. And if you'll notice, this is a thermometer. This is a little gauge right here. And it's gonna give us the temperature right above the grill grate, which is what we need to know. I'm actually gonna scoot this back just a little bit. You don't want it too close to the fire because it'll give you that uh, elevated temp that we won't really have. Now, next thing we're gonna do is take this, whoops, I'm not trying to rotate it. Are you guys with me? Hey, there we go. We're gonna take this and we're gonna feed it through these vents, which we'll talk about in just a second. You could put it through and let this, uh, this grill top clamp on it, but you're gonna end up with a hole um, and that's gonna let air out and the more air that's in there, the harder it is to control. So we're gonna plug this thing in here at the top because that's where I have things registered. Now, if you hear that beeping, that's the alarm because it's below this 220 um, that I have set. 
Right now we're sitting at 124 and that's gonna go up pretty fast. Now the right way we control this is two ways. You've got vents on the top and you've got vents down below. The vents on the top are kind of like your brakes. They do, um, they can control the temperature a little bit, um, but not a lot. You wanna make minor corrections with those. And you almost never, ever, ever wanna close them completely because you'll smother things, you'll smother the fire, you'll put out your fire, you'll make a really smoky, gross uh, food. At the bottom is essentially your gas. Now, you can't see how open those vents are um, with this thing in the way. So what you have to do is make marks. Um, when you put this thing together, I've got a mark for fully closed, I've got a mark over here for fully open, and then I've got a mark for right there in the middle. Um, and what this is honestly, this is a lot of trial and error. You have to kind of learn your equipment, you'll learn your smoker if you've got one of these things um, to figure out exactly where it needs to be. But you will know from right off the top that you don't want it fully open because that means you're getting all the oxygen in there um, that is possible. And you don't want that because we're not looking for a super hot fire. We want to be cooking today around 250. So we're not going to close it all the way. Um, we'll be cooking probably right here around a quarter. Save some time. I'm going to push it up to about halfway open so that we can get the temperature in. Um, I zoned. What is the thermometer? Good question. Um, so this is the thermometer again. It's by a company called Thermoworks. You can only buy it off their website, thermoworks.com. And this is called the smoke. It's got two probes. Um, I love it. If you notice, we're already at 208, 209 climbing. That's because we had the grill open and giving all kinds of oxygen to those charcoals. So I'm going to kick this down a little bit. And we're about only a quarter way open, which means those vents at the bottom are only open about, mm, where's there? About that much. Um, but that's all the air we need because you're also getting air up top. So let's see what temperature. So we're at about 218. Um, one thing you'll learn too as, as you learn your smoker is you learn how, uh, how fast things go up based on how open the vents are and make uh, adjustments that way. So we're already at 225, which is, um, you can actually cook at 225, a lot of people do. I'm gonna go ahead and close this even just a little bit more, basically all the way closed, which we can get away with because again, our vents at the top are open. We're cooking at 280 already, we want to get 250, so let's stop talking and get the ribs ready because the ribs are gonna take a while. Now, one cool thing with this smoke thermometer is that it comes, let's see if I can get this working. Let's see. It comes with a nice remote that is, of course, not working because why would it? Um, but the, the remote is nice because it will, um, when it's working, tell you the temperature of the uh, thermometer outside without having to go in. Go outside, rather. I know where I am. I'm not too hot. Um, without having to go outside every two seconds and check on it, which is especially good once the cook is underway. Tiger ribs. <laughs> we should have made tiger ribs. All right, I'm going to put you guys into my uh, tripod real quick. So excuse the earthquake. All right. Hopefully you can see me. I might get my wife back here. Hey, Kim. Do you want to help run a camera again? Okay. Sorry. Once again, I tried to get um, Rachel Ray's production crew and they turned me down again, which was very offensive and deeply hurtful. You know what? I'm just going to hold you guys for it again. So we've got our ribs. Um, I'm making baby back ribs. You have two different type of ribs that you can make. Baby backs are the ones that you're probably most familiar with. They're the ribs that have that um, nice little bump to them. They've got uh, kind of like a semicircle looking ribs, semicircle looking rib. If you're looking at, if you were looking at a person or at a, at a, at a hog, the uh, baby back rib is coming from the really, uh, can you see my hand? There we go. I'll just tell you, the baby back rib is coming from the basically the backbone. It's connected to the spine that's going um, down to the bottom. You've got an entire rib cage, obviously, in a, in a pig, and you've got, but you have two different cuts of ribs. The baby back are coming from the top right next to the tenderloin, and then you have what's called the spare rib, which is um, the rest of the rib, the, the rib cage, um, basically most of the rib cage. The baby back is just the top couple inches and then the spare is the rest. Now you also have what's called a St. Louis cut. That's that nice, neat, square cut rib. That's a spare rib and then they've cut off that, what on the pig would be the bottom part that rounds off so that they can square it off. And those that top piece that is, is saved in a lot of places, particularly in Chicago, I think is where we're oriented and they're called rib tips. 
I love them. If you're ever in Memphis, there's a place called Tom's Barbecue. It's south side of town in the middle of nowhere near a bunch of industrial junk. Um, but they have some of the best tip, rib tips I've ever had. They slow smoke them with this Mediterranean type rub like you would find at the Rendezvous. And then they um, toss them in this molasses based sauce. Really good. Anyway, I'm gonna hand you guys off to my wife. Do you wanna hold it so I can see people? Um, so we have our- I don't know what I'm showing you though. Oh, that's right. Okay, then you can be the cameraman. Sorry, this is super fancy. Now are you, you facing How do I fix it? the bottom? There it is. Okay. Right. We're looking at me now? Yeah. Awesome, great, I'm gonna grab some more water. So again, this is the uh, baby back. If you're looking at a pig, the baby back is right here. Spare ribs are right here. Um, they cut off this roundish part right here. Obviously, there's a lot of round part to work with here. And that's where you get your St. Louis cut. Now, um, we're gonna do a couple things here that I would have done before, but if not, just so I could, um, could show you guys the technique. When I'm making ribs, first thing I like to do is take off this membrane that they've already taken off. That's great. So usually there's a membrane. It's kind of like a, a plasticky feeling thing to, to get technical. Um, and what you would do, some people leave it on and don't think it makes a difference. I don't know that it makes a difference uh, smoke-wise. I think the, the smoke can penetrate. Um, that membrane, although if you peel it off when you're eating it, it's pretty dark, so it is impeding some of the smoke. I peel it off mostly just because of texture. It's very waxy feeling in your mouth after you eat it, so I, I make sure to get rid of it. If it was here, you would just take a knife. This is a flay knife um, or a bony knife. I like it because it's flexible um, when I'm trimming meat. But you would just take a knife. It could just be a steak knife, and you'd want to get underneath it, pull it up a little bit, use a paper towel, and you essentially just pull it right off. It's really nice. We don't have that, but we do still have a little bit of um, connective tissue back here. What I like to do is just take a knife and make a couple little slats like this. And what I'm doing is um, opening up, There's, it's not really a membrane um, per se, but opening up this, this, you're a doctor, Kim, what would you call it? Subcutaneous tissue. I don't know, I'm just connective making things tissue. up. Connective. Anyway, we're opening this up. That's just gonna let our, um, our seasonings get in there a little better. And then I like to do a little trimming. So fat is flavor, but fat that is hanging out out here is not really flavor. It's not really flavoring the meat because it's just sitting outside the meat. And even when it breaks down, it's not penetrating deep into the meat. Now I can help keep it a little moist, um, but it's meat, it's fat that's not really gonna render. You're not really gonna like uh, eating it. So I'm gonna trim off some of this excess fat. And then I'm gonna feel around these ribs to see if I have any excess meat. It's like this little thing right here is gonna just burn off. So if I've got little pieces that are hanging off, I like to pull those off because they are not gonna survive the smoke. Then I like to look at the rib itself. Now see, I've got this flap of meat right here. That is definitely not gonna survive the cook. So we're gonna go ahead and trim that off. When you're picking out ribs, um, I'm a big proponent of buy better meat less often. Get the best meat that you can. If you can find a local farm, a local butcher that has access to a local farm, those are gonna be some really good meat. Um, some really good ribs to eat. Um, if you want to go all out, you can go to places like Snake River Farms um, that sells Karabuku pork, which is kind of like the Kobe beef of, of ribs. It's a little pricier, um, but it's supposed to be really good. I haven't had that. But you can get her, um, heritage breed pork pretty easily. So that's going to be your uh, Berkshire pork, your Duroc pork. Those are breeds of uh, pigs that were raised during the Civil War, during the Revolutionary War. Um, and then kind of got bred out for what's called commodity meat. So this is commodity meat that we're working with. These are your pigs, your cows, chickens, whatever, that are uh, raised and slaughtered at these mass uh, farms. It's just the meat that you get at your regular grocery store. And it's fine in a pinch, but with barbecue, it's garbage in, garbage out. If you get super crappy meat, um, there's no way to make that super crappy meat into super amazing barbecue. You've got to start with really good meat, which is why if you go to a lot of barbecue places, the prices have gone up because for something like brisket, um, they're gonna be ordering prime brisket, which is pricier. Sometimes they'll even go wide goo, um, which is like Kobe, um, and it's super pricey. This is not, um, we got a basic rack of ribs because it's a pandemic and it's all I could get my hands on. What you wanna do though, when you're looking at this, you wanna look for like a good uh, balance of fat. Again, you want intramuscular fat. So intramuscular fat is the fat that you see right here going through the muscles. Um, extra muscular fat is the fat that's sitting on top. Um, if there's a big thick case of this, uh, not case, um, what's the word I'm looking for? If there's a lot of this, you wanna trim it down because again, it's not gonna render, it's gonna keep the rub, the rub from going down 
Um, but if it's more than like an eighth of an inch, trim it down to about an eighth of an inch. When you're looking at it too, obviously you want to go for freshness. You don't want it turning weird gray colors. Um, you want to make sure the ribs don't have any kind of injection. I don't know that that's too common, but you can find that. Um, and if you want to look for as even um, a, a rack of ribs as possible, which is sometimes a lot easier said than done. Um, but barbecue, again, is about consistency and about ease of cooking. And a lot of times, uh, if, if you have a rack of ribs or, or, you know, some pork shoulder or brisket or whatever, and you've got super thick and then super thin, it's impossible to cook that evenly and get it to cook um, or finish all at the same time. Um, this is a pretty good, I really lucked out, this is a pretty good rack of ribs. Um, one thing you want to pay attention to um, a lot of times, you've got kind of two different muscles going on here. You can see the different muscle that's, that's different color. I would tell you the name of it, but I can't tell you because I don't know. Um, but you've got a, usually a thicker end and then a thinner end. Um, this one, like I said, we lucked out and this one's pretty even. But what you want to watch for a lot of times down here are two things. One's called shiners. That's just a, um, a fun cliche term for them, but they're, they're bones that stick through the meat. Um, if you can avoid getting a rack of ribs with those, please do. But it's a lot of times you, you don't see it till you actually open up the package. Um, and what you'd want to do is just trim that off. It's painful because you're, you're getting rid of meat and having to throw it away that you paid for, um, but it's not going to survive the cook. It's going to turn into jerky. It's not going to be any good. The other thing you have are uh, hanging bones or an invisible bone that's over here a lot of times. Um, we've got a little bit of one right here, um, but it's not, I mean, the meat's pretty good and pretty thick. It's not really worth uh it's not really worth cutting. So we actually locked out. I was hoping we were going to have more to trim just to show you guys, but we don't. So um, first thing that we are going to do is uh, grab some oil. All we're doing with this oil, you can use oil. Some people use mustard. You can use water. It really doesn't make a difference. Um, I, I usually just use oil because partly I just don't like mustard. Um, and then sometimes I've used water. What I'll usually do, one of the best things you can do for your meat, um, whether it's barbecue or steak or chicken or whatever, is to salt it the night before. Or if you go grocery shopping in the morning and you get home, make sure the first thing you do is, is salt the steak that you have. Uh, about a half a teaspoon, I think, um, per pound. So it's not a lot, but that salt will get into the meat and moisturize the meat, tenderize the meat in ways that a rub won't. Because salt is the only thing that can actually penetrate down deep into the muscle tissue. All of these great seasonings um, are too thick to get in between the muscles, between the protein bonds, um, to really get into that meat. And so when you hear about people rubbing their meat, and that sounds really gross, when you hear about people um, putting their rub on 24 hours, 48 hours in advance, they're not doing themselves any good, they're not doing the meat any good, because uh, the... Uh, the rub just physically cannot get down deep in the meat, past about, again, about an eighth of an inch. Check out AmazingRibs.com. They break all this down. They've got all the science behind it. It's really neat and interesting. Um, like I said before, I usually will salt this the night before, but I didn't because I wanted to show you guys um, how I make my rub. Now, I make a salt-free rub, and the reason for that is it allows me to control the amount of salt. So if you ever use... Um, a store-bought uh, rub, God forbid, it's going to have a lot of salt in it, um, mostly because salt's cheap and it uh, makes for a higher profit margin, but it's going to have a lot of salt in it. So you don't want to salt your meat separately if you're using a commercial store-bought rub. But since we're making a rub today, we're going to do it separately. Um, I'm using kosher salt. Kosher salt has bigger flakes than table salt, um, so be mindful of that. Uh, do you... It, Kosher salt looks like you've salted it more than you really have because the flakes are bigger, um, but it's not going to be nearly as salty. Like I said, about half a tablespoon. I like to do this high. I've done this enough um, that I know kind of what I'm looking at. You're essentially just salting it like you would if you were salting the steak um, on the plate that was already cooked. I salt it just, you're going to salt it a little bit more than that. Um, you may be freaking out about all the salt, I promise. Salt is flavor, just like fat is flavor. This is not going to be too salty. It's going to be nice and um, delicious. We're going to make sure we salt all, um, every side, both sides. If you see, I've got my hand on the side of the meat as I do this. Um, mostly what I'm doing here is just trying to help clean up the mess. Like last time with the turkey, I used that aluminum foil pan, and those are great for this, but I was expecting to have to trim, so I've got this oversized um, cookie sheet out. Not cookie sheet out. Um, cutting board. Cutting board. There you go. That's why I have a, a production assistant. Anyway, so we're going to go, we've got our salt on here. That's our first layer. If I was doing this the night before, I would just wrap this up in aluminum foil. Might stick the whole thing in a, um, in a tray just to make sure in case any juices look out. Look out, that's gross. Um, come out that they... Uh, don't make a mess. Don't make a mess. 
And then it just hit me that my, <laughs> the recipe for my, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Rub. The rub is on my phone. Let me grab my laptop real quick and hopefully it's on there. I should know it. I know it's in my rub. You're supposed to talk to people and keep them entertained. I'm showing them the meat. Do you have any questions while we're waiting? Let's see. Uh, there you go. All right, let's see if I can pull this up. If not, we have to restart. <laughs> Tom asks, how you talk without me? Oh, hey. Not well. Hey, I found the rub uh, recipe. Yay! I'm gonna wash my hands up. What did he say? Tom asked how you talk without me. How I talk without you? I don't know. All right, so I found my rub, which uh, ingredients, which is going to be really helpful for actually making the rub. Um, what's in my rub? I uh, normally wouldn't tell people, but I like you guys, so I'm going to tell you as soon as I find, hey, dark brown sugar. Like I said, my rub has no salt in it. Um, but it does have plenty of sugar for all you health nuts out there. Um, I use a combination of brown sugar, which has a little more molasses in it, white sugar, which obviously has no molasses in it. Then we're using, I've got paprika. Oh no, that's gonna be gross. We're gonna save that for later. Uh, paprika, I've got some chili powder. What else do I have? This is the one in order of quantity. Um, we have some garlic, black pepper, onion, uh, and then a couple of odd ingredients, rosemary and celery seed. What you're trying to accomplish in a rub, um, just like in a sauce, is a balance of flavors. You want like sweet and savory in a sauce. You know, you want some acidity um, with that sweetness as well. Here, I'm trying to get some sweet and some savory. Um, I want a little bit of bite to it. That's where the celery comes in. A little bit of savoriness, unctuousness, some herbaceousness. That's where the rosemary comes in. But these aren't big profile flavors. They're gonna be in the background. The main notes that you're gonna um, taste in this are gonna be the brown sugar and the black pepper and um, and the chili powder a little bit. You're gonna get a little bit of paprika. The paprika doesn't really have a whole lot of flavor. Most of it is there for color. Um, and then, you know, garlic and onion are both giving you some of that savory note um, in the background as well. But again, it's a balance. The thing about barbecue is there's no right way. Um, there's definitely a lot of wrong ways to screw things up, but there's no right rub. If you're in Texas, you may only use salt and pepper. Um, I've seen people not even do that, which I think is dumb. It makes no sense. You at least need salt on your meat. Um, but make, you know, any kind of rub combination that you want, whatever makes you happy, whatever um, floats your boat, whatever makes your taste buds happy. And then adjust. I mean, this is something that I've tweaked over time and will continue to tweak. I get feedback from my wife constantly about what she likes or doesn't like when I make adjustments. Penny's asking if you use regular paprika or smoked paprika. That is a great question. I use regular paprika. I have smoked paprika. If you were going to do this rub at home in the oven, um, so you could cheat and make this, you know, kind of thing in the oven. The America Says uh, Kitchen has a rainy day ribs recipe. Um, if you were not going to be adding smoke via a smoker, then sure, you could use smoked paprika. I used to use it, but I found that it created a little bit of a acrid kind of back note taste after after it was done smoking because it was too much smoke because you can definitely get too much smoke on your meat. Um, and so I use regular paprika. That's a great question. All right, let's make this rub. So a lot of times um, um, I would go ahead and uh, take my dark brown sugar and run it through a spice grinder, this spice grinder. And the reason for that is that um, there's that molasses in there is very, makes the sugar very moist. And because of that, it creates those little clumps that we all know and hate in brown sugar. And so if you grind it up, it's going to help prevent some of that. Um, and then in turn, because you have less clumps, um, it's going to help it as you run it through a, uh, a spice shaker. So your sauce, your rub actually comes out. So I'm using, um, this is a double, I, use, I have a, a recipe based on a small batch so that I can constantly make adjustments. This is going to be a double of a small batch. So I've got six tablespoons of dark sugar. We're going to do equal parts dark and white sugar, so we're going to go six tablespoons of white sugar, two, three, 
four, five, six. And this is not baking. So if you have rounded off tablespoons, if you add a little bit more, a little bit less of something, it's not going to kill you or the rub. I'm gonna make a huge mess and I apologize. All right, so next ingredient is our paprika. Again, it's just regular paprika. I highly recommend getting the best spices you can. There's a company called Kinsey's that um, may have a store in your area. I love them. They don't have one here, um, so I'm confined to the grocery store. This was just kind of cheaper stuff, but the uh, Spice Islands and McCormick Organics are pretty good. We're gonna be using four tablespoons of paprika. One, two, three, and four. I like to do this over the sink because I create messes and makes it easier to clean up. So we got paprika, we got brown sugar, we got white sugar, we got a computer that keeps turning off. Now we're gonna do two tablespoons of garlic. Make sure you wipe off or wash off your tablespoons in between if you're using the same one so you don't mix and match seasonings because that'd be gross. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's gross too. And it's blocking the view. Say what? It's blocking the view. Oh. Are our kids still alive? I'm not sure. Oh. No, they're both on separate TVs. Oh, okay. Well, when you can't parent, Netflix is a good alternative. Sorry, guys, I thought this was open. It is not. But it wouldn't be me if I didn't have a, have a glitch. <laughs> Penny said you need to take out stock and paprika. I do. I've got a giant thing of chili powder, but I need to get a giant thing of paprika. So we're gonna do two tablespoons of garlic. You don't need a ton of garlic for this, but it's about our, I'd say it's our medium. Oh, here we go. So like I said before, I've got my alarm. It's finally working. This tells me that the temperature's down to 220. We want it to be 250. So I'm gonna mark, go outside real quick. Kim's gonna follow me, maybe. Um, and and adjust the temperature. The way we do that is by adjusting the vents. So I had closed this vent all the way because it was going up really fast. Now I need to open it up to give some oxygen to get the temperature going. So this is our gas. By opening it up, we put more air in the in the tank or more air in the, uh, in the cooker. And by doing that, we put more air in the charcoal, which makes fire. So we don't want uh, a huge amount. If we open this up full bore, um, it's gonna send that temperature shooting up. We're at about the temperature that's that's good for barbecue. 225 is what a lot of people cook at. We're gonna do about 250 because I don't want to sit here for 18 hours on ribs. So I'm gonna open it up just a little bit, about a quarter of an inch. Again, I've got markings. This is fully closed. This is half closed. We're gonna go just under a quarter of an opening. And that should give us just enough air to get this temperature back. And when you've got a temperature, I'm sorry, a good thermometer like this with the decimal point, it's gonna, um, you can follow it and you can see um, where it's going. One of the things you need to be mindful of here too is being patient um, because if you get frustrated and say, okay, I've been sitting here for a minute and this decimal hasn't moved, I need to open it up to get it going some more. You're going to keep opening and opening and opening it and eventually you're going to flood it with air and it's going super fast. So you just kind of have to sit and wait, give it a couple minutes. Barbecue is low and slow cooking and it's low and slow waiting. Um, but I think we should be good. Yep, see, we're already heading in the right direction. They already went up 0.3. Um, by the time we get done with our ribs, that should be at a good temperature to start cooking. All right, let's go finish making our rub. Thank you, wife. I owe you. Mm -hmm. All right, last thing we put in there was garlic. So right next to the garlic is black pepper. Um, not all black pepper is created equal, and this is celery, so it's definitely not equal. Not all black pepper is created equal. Um, for one, there's a quality in the pepper itself, um, but the thing that we're really concerned with today is the size of the grind. Um, you can get really fine um, cracked pepper. You can get um, a really rough, I'm sorry, you can get a really fine ground pepper, a cracked pepper, um, or this is called a coarse ground. Uh, the problem is a lot of people use different names for the same thing. When you're ordering online, you wanna look at a mesh number, and the mesh you're looking for is 16. And what that means is that's the size that the, the ground peppercorns, um, how, how big of a hole in a mesh that they would fit through. And so we're looking for 16. So it's kind of in between a fine grind and a big crack like you would get at Olive Garden if you wanted pepper on your salad. Um, 
it's nice, it's uniform, it's big, you're gonna get the flavor um, without it being too spicy. So it's kind of a similarity between kosher salt and table salt. This is a little big, um, the kernels are a little big, so you can go um, put a little bit more on there without it being super peppery, as opposed to if it was um, really fine and you put the same amount, it would um, get a little spicy. We're gonna use two tablespoons of pepper because I do like a little bit of kick. I think pepper is a really, really underrated seasoning, um, especially with barbecue. If you do like I do with brisket and it's just salt and just pepper, um, you can really pick up notes and complexity in a really good pepper um, that you wouldn't notice before if it's just like table pepper that you're putting on your potato. There's a lot of complexity in really good pepper. Um, it's a highly underrated seasoning. So we got our pepper. Next thing we're gonna do is some chili powder. I like the smokiness of the chili powder, like we were talking about before, of not using uh, smoked paprika. You get a little bit of smoke flavor here without it creating an acrid taste um, when you're doing the ribs. I'm using a tablespoon of chili powder. And then we're going to use a tea, uh, two teaspoons of onion powder. I'm so glad I did dishes. Two teaspoons of onion powder. I uh, Some recipes call for a little more onion powder. I really don't like onion powder. Um, but it, this helps give it some of that savoriness. It helps kind of balance things out um, so we need it. You're not going to taste a lot of it. Um, but onion powder is very strong flavor to me, so I, I use it because I need it, but I don't use a lot of it. Next two things we're going to use, and these are both in equal parts. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did I just do one teaspoon? I need two teaspoons of onion powder. I'm glad you guys caught that or I would have forgotten. Two teaspoons of onion powder. And last two things are our herb components. These are kind of background components, but they, they round out the flavor, I think, in a really nice way. Um, first thing we're gonna do is uh, celery seed. These are whole celery seeds. Um, they actually, don't they come from, I wanna say they came from the cilantro plant, or is that, I don't know, don't, don't take my word for that. I like this. This is a flavor note that I stole from um, Oklahoma Joe's, which is now Joe's, Kansas City. Um, they use it in their rub, and it gives a nice, bright bite uh, to things at the end. I'm gonna leave out a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna do about three quarters of a teaspoon because my wife is watching and she's not as big of a fan of the celery as I am. Also, I uh, put this top on the same cutting board. Um, this is a pork, which I should not have done. This is uh, rosemary. Um, this is called, they call it crushed. You could also find it as cracked, um, but you could use um, ground rosemary as well. You would not use, I think, as much. You'd have to Google. I don't know what the, the uh, substitution amounts are. I'm using a teaspoon of cracked rosemary here, or you can find it as crushed, but this is not ground. So you still have the whole kind of seeds that are dried Hold out on. there. Oh. oh, sorry. You can see it there. It, you're getting kind of a half of a seed, half of a leaf. I don't know what you would call it for each one. Anyway, um, I'm gonna grab my towel real quick. This is our rub. This is plenty of rub. We're making pulled pork again tomorrow, so that's why I made a double amount um, that I normally would. You're gonna shake this up. You wanna, <laughs> uh, as, you, as you shake it up, you wanna one, make sure you have good uh, sandwich bags. But you wanna go in, make sure you smash up the... Um... You can't see. You can't see it, no, I'm sorry. You're showing me the sealed part. Oh, you wanna make sure and smash up all of these uh, little bits of brown sugar, or otherwise they will not mix up. Get this really mixed up. You want to do this before you obviously put it into a jar. Um, you don't have to put it into a jar. I invested in some spice jars a while ago. Or, you know, you could just keep the jars from whatever seasonings you already have in your pantry, wash them out, and use those, which I've done as well. I just ordered some bigger ones because I, uh, I make more barbecue than most people. Anyway, we're going to get this nice and mixed up. Again, there's no salt in this. We already salted the barbecue rib or the baby back ribs separately. But you want to go through, and again, this is why a lot of times I will, um, I will grind or send the uh, dark brown sugar through a coarse, I'm sorry, through a uh, spice grinder. You could use light brown sugar as well if you just don't have that um, and don't want to go out in the store and risk getting coronavirus. Just use, just use that. Now I've got a spice. Let's use this one. I bought this off of Amazon. They're super duper cheap. It's just a spice bottle. And you've got the two measurements for thought fodder for a, a little bit or a lot. We're gonna dump all of this in here. I didn't get all of my little bits of brown sugar, but that's okay. I'll work on that later. Right now, we're just gonna get this meat on the smoker. 
Anybody have any questions that I need to answer while we're doing this? Do you use the same rabba for all your different meats, as Kyle Todd? That's a great question. Uh, no. So this this rub is designed for pork and poultry. Uh, I use this uh, on ribs and pulled pork, and you could use it on chicken or turkey, but you would not want to use it on beef because there's a lot of sugar. And um, I mean, you could, if you really wanted to, I mean, some people make brisket and they have sugar in their rubs. I'm a purist, like I said, salt and pepper. Um, so you could try it. I honestly, I've never used it on beef intentionally, but this is primarily for pork um, and for chicken because of the high sugar content uh, in rubs. Anyway, let's get to rubbing. So for our rub, um, we like I said, we've got two two options, and honestly, I don't remember which one we're going to use this time. So we got the small kind of sifter, and then we've got the big bad boy, which we may end up using depending on what comes out of here. Again, I like to hold this up high. Um, it allows the the uh, the seasonings to fall more evenly. If you throw it here, if you I'm sorry, if you try to shake your your rub down here, it's going to clump up a lot. If you do it up here, you've got a little more control, and it's just a little uh, flip flick of the wrist back and forth. Like I said, those holes are too small, so we're gonna go with the big opening. But of course, with the big opening, you need to be extra careful because a lot's gonna come out at a time. You're gonna keep this at about a, you're the mathematician. What kind of angle is that? That's like a- 45 degree angle. It's about a 45, maybe 60 degree angle. Um, we got some of our big clumps falling out, but that's okay. And we're gonna just gonna go a little bit at a time across. I'm gonna knock these clumps out. Actually, I'm going to shake this up because those are annoying. Me. Unfortunately, those clumps are going to come to the top. And when we shake it, that's going to happen again. But that's okay. Um, we're not as concerned with this back side. Uh, we want to make sure we get a nice, even coating. And, of course, it doesn't look that way because some of those early clumps fell out of there. That oil or water or, or mustard or whatever that you decide to use uh, is gonna help this stuff stay on there. We're not gonna put it as thick on the back as we're on the front because most of the back is just bone. And so if you um, pour a bunch of rub on the back, you're not really flavoring a whole lot. It's called rub because you do wanna kind of rub it in. Uh, if you wanna go through and massage it, that's, that's on you and your um, barbecue. I don't wanna judge your relationship with your meat. But you're gonna put a little bit on the back I make sure just to cover everything once. And basically we're gonna cover everything tw uh, once on the back and tw uh, twice on the top. And this is the back, which is where you can see the bones. Then we're gonna flip it over. And we're gonna go, like I said, about 45, 60 degree angle. N nice shakes, so you don't do that. Um, and just kind of let it fall like rain. I've got my hand here to help kind of to do two things. One with the mess, like we said before, but you can also help put the rub on the side because we're going to want that rub there as well. You're going to try to, or you want to want to stop every couple minutes, shake this up, make sure that your seasonings are still nice, nice and mixed up and even. We're going to get a nice coat, a nice thin coat, just to make sure everything's covered. I like to pat it down just to kind of see where I'm working with. And then I like to get a nice, thick, heavy coat. You don't want to go too nuts, but like, you know, we put a lot of work and time and effort into developing the rub and then making the rub. So I want to actually taste the rub. So let's make sure we get all of this in there. A nice, good coat. Now, two things that I'm doing here with patting it in. One is helping it stick, so when I pick it up, it doesn't all just fall off. But if you'll notice, as I push it in, it gets wet. Um, it picks up the moisture of whatever it is that's holding the rub on, whether that's oil, water, mustard, mustard or uh, baby food, whatever you decide to use. Um, but the reason we want to make sure it's a little bit wet is that wet meat attracts smoke better than dry meat. Wet cold meat especially um, attracts uh, attract smoke and the smoke will stick to it better because those um, that water particles the oil particles whatever it is um, they're wet they're sticky they're tacky and if you can get a nice tacky surface as the smoke goes over the meat it's going to hold on to that smoke if it's dry if it's super dry on the top it's just going to go over it like a nice smooth surface so we want it we want it to be a little tacky um, if we can which i think we've got a nice little tacky surface i think we're ready to go we've got a rub on um, let's go check the temperature. Temperature right now is 227. We're going to bump that up to 250 eventually, but right now that's good enough. Uh, it's good enough to work. So let's take our barbecue out there. I'm going to do one more thing actually. 
This is a little trick that you probably already know, um, but we are going to clean and de-stickify, um, non-stickify the, uh, the grill grate. We're going to pour a little bit of oil. This is safflower oil. One thing Kim and I learned from some cooking classes is that you really shouldn't be cooking with um, olive oil. Uh, olive oil has a really low smoke point, and so if you're using it to cook, saute, things like that, it burns really fast. So you really should be using vegetable oil, um, grapeseed oil, safflower oil. They all have much higher um, smoke points. Is somebody making fun of me for the smoke points? No, they're making fun of you for not washing your hands long enough. Oh, yeah. That was like 10 seconds. Yeah. I slowed the video down. It was really three minutes of washing. All right. Hey, you know what? I got nothing. All right, let's take this out there. It's a little heavy. To be fair, he's rubbing off the meat and not the coronavirus. The coronavirus actually adds a nice um, umami flavor to your ribs. So if you can, if you're already infected, go ahead and cough on those bad boys with a nice uh, second dose of the coronavirus. Anyway, all right, so here we are. We have, yeah, it's, it's the alarm. If you're looking, you ain't cooking. Um, and there's some truth to that, but it's okay to take a peek every once in a while. But one thing you wanna be careful of when you are using, um, especially a Weber like this, is all your heat is up here. If you take this over and flip it open like this, all your heat is gonna escape and it's gonna really um, screw up uh, your temperature and, and where you're at, or where you hope to be at. We're gonna lift it up a little bit. I've got this oil soaked, hi darling, oil soaked paper towel. I'm gonna lift this just straight up so I don't lose all the temperature. And I'm going to clean this grate off a little bit in the bedroom. This is going to get some of that funk and grime off because again, that funk and grime is not adding, adding flavor. It's just adding carcinogens called creosine. This oil also will help your ribs not stick. We've got a nice yucky thing. We're going to be smoking today with hickory because hickory is what I have on hand. Let's see if we got a nice piece that will fit. So the pieces I have are all super chunky and bigger than I would normally use, but I haven't got my chainsaw out to trim them down yet. With ribs, again, you can use any kind of wood you want. It's not really gonna make a big difference. Just make sure it's a hardwood, a hardwood that has uh, mm -hmm. been seasoned. And what that means is the wood is essentially dried out. You don't wanna use green wood, so you don't wanna go chop down a tree in your backyard, chop up the pieces, throw it in here. You're gonna have way too much uh, water and it's not gonna catch fire very quickly. But you also don't want it to be super dried out. The stuff that you get at Academy Sports or at Lowe's or whatever is gonna be called kiln dried. So they put it in a kiln just like you would pottery. And um, you can use it, but it's taking almost all the moisture out. And I've had some that have created um, not just like funky smoke, uh, dark white smoke, but even like yellow smoke that's been super gross. And you also don't really know for sure what wood you're getting. It may say apple, it may say hickory, but the reality is if you're a big company and you've got an order to make, you may throw in some hickory into that apple just to make the order because um, you can't really smell it um, and know what you're looking at. Even the bark can be very deceptive. Uh, oak and hickory can look very similar. Um, the only thing you can really tell this difference of is cedar and you're not smoking with cedar unless you're Thank doing you. salmon. Say oh, hi to Can you say hi to everybody? Hi. <laughs> um, but we're gonna be using hickory today. Um, this is pretty decently seasoned. It's about three, four months old. Some people go as much as nine, 10 months, 12, uh, a full year. I know how many months are in a year, <laughs> a full year. This chunks is actually bigger than what we'll need. You really, if you're going to do a setup like this, you can use the chunks that you get at the store. You want to use about four ounces at a time for about the first hour or two. You don't necessarily need to have smoke going the entire time because you can over smoke your meat. But we're going to use hickory. We're going to go and stick this and we're going to kind of push it into the coals. We just want it to smolder. You do not need to soak it in water. Um, the only thing you would maybe soak in water are chips. But again, I wouldn't use chips. I would use, if you can use chips and you can probably use chunks and I would use chunks, but you don't need to soak with water because again, just like with rubs, not actually get into the meat, the water doesn't really get into the wood that deep. Um, that's why they made boats out of wood because boats don't really absorb a ton of water um, It's only going to get in there a, a fraction of an inch And so it's not really going to do you a whole lot of good But if it's tucked into the coals, it's going to be smothered by that and then also it's not going to the oxygen is going to be cut down Because of the uh, the closed fan. So we're gonna Jason agrees with you that this stuff doesn't burn well from Academy and Home Depot Yeah, and Drew is asking what do you mean if the wood is seasoned? Oh great. All right, so let me See if we can get this in here. I want to make sure it's actually touching coals. There we go. Let's see if we can actually close that. 
We can. So what season means is basically how dry the wood is. You can buy a pretty cheap um, uh, meter on Amazon, which I need to get, that you can put on the wood and it will tell you how much moisture is in there. Um, because the moisture content is going to determine how fast the wood burns. Um, when you're trying to get this nice, if you can see there's this nice thin blue smoke that we have, this is what you're trying to get. You don't want a super heavy smoke. You definitely don't want black smoke. If you got black smoke coming out of here, something is wrong. Um, if you, basically, if you don't have blue or white smoke, something is wrong. You need to get the meat out of there. You want this nice thin blue smoke. And the only way you can get that is through um, the combustion of real um, solid wood because it's creating a fire and that fire is burning off the impurities um, when you uh, you have wood that is green and is not seasoned there's a lot of moisture it's very heavy and so you're gonna get more of a thick white smoke because there's a lot of more additives that are being burned off um, and if you get a really 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 seasoned wood and it tastes and it feels like cardboard um, that means almost all the uh, the moisture is out of there and it's gonna burn super super fast and you're gonna be burning through wood so you want to kind of find that happy place in between green wood and, and overly seasoned wood and if you go on Facebook marketplace tons of people are selling seasoned wood all the time it's super super easy to find um, and you just want to make sure you get a guy that you trust that's actually giving you the type of wood that you said we got our temperature going we've got our grill grate season we've got our wood in here we've got some smoke so let's put on the ribs I'm gonna have my wife help me out um, and she I don't know how much of the video you're gonna be able to see this but she's gonna try to lift this straight up and I'm going to put the ribs on I'm gonna go ahead I'm gonna try yep do both ready let's just look one two three all right and then we want to make sure that we're not touching anything if we can help it. And you want to make sure that the meat is kind of um, put on here evenly. Sorry, I'm going to kill my wife because there's a lot of smoke. All right, hold on. Give right in the eyes. I know, I'm sorry. Give me just a second. Okay. We're going to bunch that up. You want to make sure it's not touching the sides. You also want to make sure you can kind of keep that heat if you can. Okay. Okay. Sorry, hold on. Give me just a second. It's not. Okay. <laughs> I have a long-suffering wife, and she's awesome, and thank you. Thank you, wife. So, I, uh, I have fallen in love with my other smokers, so it's been a while since I've actually done this on this smoker. But like I said, this is a great setup because it's cheap. Um, it's a great setup because you get a lot of bang for your buck because um, putting that metal basket in there means, or that removable metal basket in there, means we can take it out and we can still use it grill on, which I do all the time. And again, that slow and sear is great because it helps funnel the, the heat up so that you can get a really, really nice steakhouse kind of sear on steak. So we're going to watch this for just a second. It's getting back up to temperature. Um, I'm going to go watch for 20 seconds this time. Do you have any questions? Mm. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? I forgot one important thing. I forgot to do one super important thing. If anybody can remember it or anybody knows what it is, you'll get cool points. Anybody know what I forgot to put in the smoker? Yeah, that's gonna melt. I think I can use this. Yeah. Forget to put a water pan in there. Um, one of the keys of barbecue is not drying the meat out. That makes for terrible barbecue. And one way to do that is by putting a water pan in. I use a water pan. Tom guessed it. What? Tom got it. Oh, yeah. Must be a Spencer got it, too. Nice. Cool points for everyone. Penny got it. Um, water pan adds moisture to the air, makes it a humid environment. And a uh, humid environment helps keep meat moist. I'm wearing, these are Weber gloves, like I said before. I like these a lot better than the uh, silicone or rubber ones. They're, they're, they're not cotton. I don't know what they're made of, but they're woven. awesome. Say what? They're woven. They're woven. I can pick up live coals with this. I mean, it does a really good job of insulating heat, um, but the silicone rubber ones, for me at least, they heat up like immediately and they're terrible. So I'm gonna try to add this very carefully. She's gonna butcher our temperature. temperature, but you know what? You need me? No, I think I can get this. It's a lot easier to do this when you're not dumb and you remember at the very beginning. Alright. 
All right, we probably lost a little bit of heat, but shouldn't be too bad. These uh, Weber smokers, or, I'm sorry, Weber grills are well insulated. Now that's beeping because again, my low uh, threshold is 220, my high threshold is 250. Those are just numbers I picked because um, I, I liked them and they were, uh, gave me some space, some wiggle room if it got too low um, and then 250 got too high. So we'll keep an eye on that. We've got the other thing. Uh, let's go make some barbecue sauce. <laughs> So, I'm going to have Kim keep an eye on, on our uh, temperature. And we're going to make some barbecue sauce. So this is my, my secret recipe. Please don't share it with anyone. This is a sauce that I, uh, I bottle up and send around the world. I actually have sent this internationally because I think I sent some to Sarah Bessie who lives in Canada. Canada yeah. Yeah, and Carlos, but he's in Puerto Rico, which is the United States, but it's almost kind of counts. Um, you may not be expecting this, but I find this to be super healthy. Help, that healthy is not a word, helpful. It's a digital scale, um, and uh, since a pint is a pound the world around, um, I can measure dry and liquid ingredients in this. And what's really nice is I don't have to go through a bunch of measuring cups. I can use my pot, put it right on here, make sure it's empty. Tear the weight out to zero. Start adding my ingredients. So let's add the ingredients. Oh, you know what? My recipe's on there. Let's see if I can find that on here. Guava. Nope. Sauce. Give me just a second, guys. Huh. That's Firebirds. Hmm. Let's see if I can pull it up on here real quick. Hold on one second, guys. So I'm dumb and forgot about my phone beyond the tension. I know you can cut it with a knife. Oh, here it is. Let's see. I'm gonna write it down all right here while you guys are watching me. Let's create a new note. We're gonna be using I'm gonna make a double amount of this. So, six ounces of, they can, can you guys still see me? I think you can. Worcestershire sauce. Oops. Why is that doing that? 60? Nope. Autocorrect is the worst. What in the world is it doing? Six ounces of Worcestershire sauce. We're gonna use, that's gonna give us our umami and our savory flavor. We're going to use 10 ounces of ketchup. We're going to use 10 ounces of apple cider vinegar. It's going to give us some acidity and a little bit of bite. We're going to use 10 ounces of my secret ingredient, so don't tell anyone, um, guava nectar. You can get this, uh, I get it at Publix. It's usually pretty easy to find in the Hispanic aisle. Um, but it gives a nice, sweet, tangy, sour note to, uh, to the uh, sauce that I have found that I really enjoy. Actually, the reason I found it um, was because we were at a – I left the onion or the uh, honey out last time. Yeah. I did. Um, two teaspoons of salt. We were at a Thai restaurant, and they give you those candies um, at the end, or at least ours does. And they – I just really liked the flavor, and I was like, well, what is this? And they said, it is guava flavor. And I was like, you know what? I bet this would be really good in barbecue sauce. Your temperature's going up pretty quickly. What temperature is it at? 245, almost 246. Okay, do you mind going and turn it all the way to the left for me? Sure. And then here's our last secret ingredient is chipotle salsa. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second. All right, you guys all still there? Everybody's still with me? Somebody say yes so I know. Oh, here comes my wife. She'll help us out. All right, so back to the barbecue sauce. Um, in my, oh, you're turning it around. I gotta see. First ingredient in the barbecue sauce is Worcestershire sauce. As I said, we're gonna use six tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce. I have more Worcestershire sauce than anyone should own. Let's see if I'm still teared off. Zero ounces. We're gonna do six ounces. Um, if you're doing a big, um, gigantic pot of this stuff 
Um, one nice easy thing to do is to pop out this plastic part. It comes out a whole lot faster. That one is empty, so I'm gonna go grab some more. Give me just one second. So Worcestershire sauce has got all kinds of wonderful things in it. Obviously it's great with pot roast, but it's kind of a standard ingredient in a lot of barbecue sauces. Like I said, it gives a nice savory flavor. You got a nice umami punch because one of the ingredients in Worcestershire sauce is sardines. No, not sardines, anchovies. Which is kind of weird, but the British are weird. All right, 5.2, 5.3, 4. 5.9, come on, six ounces. So again, what I like here is you get an exact measurement instead of just having to eyeball, make sure you've got the line um, correct on your measuring cup. But I also like the fact that you can put it all in the pot um, and you don't have to clean up uh, as many dirty dishes. So now we're gonna use ketchup. Ketchup is gonna give us some sweet flavor, some acidity, and we are going for 10 ounces of ketchup. I use Heinz. It really does kind of make a difference um, if you get like really, really crappy ketchup, it's just not going to taste as good. Give it the real stuff. Get Heinz. Apple cider vinegar. This is, again, going to give us more acidity, uh, more tang. Um, you could use ap um, white vinegar if you have it just for the sake of acidity, but it is not going to taste exactly the same. Um, I mean, you're not going to get that sour note from the apple um, that you do from this. So we're going to do 10 ounces of apple cider vinegar. This, again, is Heinz. Um, I haven't noticed as much of a difference between apple cider vinegar from Heinz and like the grocery store version. Let's see. And when I say crappy ketchup, I mean don't get ketchup at the dollar store if you can avoid it. All right, 10 ounces of apple cider vinegar. And now my favorite ingredient, ten, um, guava nectar. This is what it looks like. You can also get this stuff in cans. I like it in the paper a little bit better. Um, how are we doing on temperature? 247, look at that. We want to be at 250, that's pretty good. 247.8. Um, with your temperatures, you want to get them as exact as you can, but if you want to shoot for 250 and you hit 247 or 252, it's not really that big of a deal. The bigger deal is trying to maintain that temperature. Um, you'll be fine. Anyway, so I had guava candy at a Thai restaurant one time, really liked it. It's got a nice sweet flavor, but also gives a little bit of a sour um, punch. So again, sweet and sour, you want balanced flavors. So we're gonna do 10 ounces of this. You get it in the uh, Hispanic food aisle at the grocery store, or go to a Hispanic grocery store, it's even better. They definitely will have it. Um, not every grocery store has this stuff. I used to use peach nectar. Peach nectar also works really well. Um, you don't really need either, but I, I really like this. I think it gives it a nice, unique flavor. You also did coffee. Yep, and I've used coffee as well. This is just giving it a little more flavor balance. Um, I like this just because I like the way it tastes. I liked the coffee one. You like coffee? I like this one too, but I liked the coffee one the best, I think. Oh. Had a punch to it. Oh. I love uh, coffee. Yeah, see, I don't like coffee as much. All right, now we got some light brown sugar. Um, we're going to do nine ounces of light brown sugar. Oh, um, can you just wash your hands instead of using all the sanitizer? Sanitizer? That's what she calls it. Oh. I'm not correcting her. It's too cute. It is very cute. Seven and a half, eight and a half. There we go. Nine. And what's up next? Light brown sugar, half of... I forgot it. What is the half of? Oh, half Abby agrees with me. This said uh, coffee would have less sugar as well, which sounds great. Yeah, no, that's the great thing about this is, um, and the great thing with barbecue that I really like a lot is that this is what I like. It may not be what you like, and that's okay. Um, this is a, a really kind of a base sauce that I got off of um, that website that I keep mentioning, uh, amazingribs.com. They have a what they call a Kansas City style barbecue sauce which is um, the kind of barbecue sauce that you think of when you think of barbecue sauce. And I took that base um, recipe and changed some things, um, took away some stuff, added some new stuff, and made it I made it something that I like. And that's one of the things I love about barbecue and what I'm hoping to write in my next book um, is the diversity. I mean, you could have a um, sauce that's just like this. You could have a sauce that's um, you know mostly vinegar, which was one we're gonna make tomorrow, an East Carolina mop sauce 
for a pulled pork. You could have sauce that's got mustard in it, like they do in South Carolina. Like you could have sauce that's got a lot of um, molasses, or which would be kind of Kansas City, or a lot of um, or none, like ketchup. Memphis. <laughs> yeah, or Memphis, where you're going to have no. Um, you're probably not going to have either molasses, or you may not have sauce at all. You may just do dry rubs. Um, that's the beauty of barbecue. If you like uh, coffee more in your sauce, put coffee in there. Play around with it, experiment, have some fun. Uh, like I said before, I don't like um, onion powder, but I do like onions. So we're gonna use a real onion. And we're gonna get, we're gonna take, uh, we're gonna dice this up half a cup, if I can find my half a cup. Hi, sweet pie. Here's a third of a cup. So you wanna come around and say hi to everybody? You wanna say hi, Munchkin? No. Not really. You know what? We're gonna. This is not baking. So a lot of our, uh, our not ingredients, but uh, my. Measurements. Drew wants to know: Is barbecue really the next book? How does one become a research assistant? <laughs> well, barbecue is is my next book that I'm hoping to write. Not a, I don't want to write a cookbook. So with my book on rapture, um, it was not really a book about end times theology. I mean, it was. But end time theology for me was just a way to talk about Christian discipleship because you can't just write a Christian discipleship book because there's a thousand Christian discipleship books out there. So you need a hook, you know, you need a framework to talk about. And for me, it was the end times theology because um, that was my background. Sorry, we got kids. Told you this is a top-notch professional production. Go tell. Oh, tell she her she has, to, has share. to share the nerds. And those are the ones that haven't been opened yet. Tell her not to open those. Sorry, I got nerds and my kids stole them and this is a legitimate family crisis. Um, but no, so um, I wanna write about community um, and how we bring people together. You know, how you go about actually loving your enemies like I talk about all the time. And I think barbecue is a great way to do that. Um, Anthony Bourdain had this great saying that barbecue may not be the key to world peace, but it's a good start. And he was kind of talking off the cuff, but I think there's a lot of truth there. Um, there's a lot of diversity in barbecue and styles of barbecue. There's a lot of diversity in ingredients, in the people that make it, um, in its history. Um, even something as simple. Yeah, we'll help you in just a second, Sippy. What do you need, darling? The pink coconut bowl. The pink, pink coconut, coconut bowl. bowl. The I, last time I saw the bowls, they were in the living room, sweetheart. You'll have to look for it. I'll help you in just a second. Um, something as simple as ketchup actually has a really interesting story. If Kim holds the camera, I'm sorry. Sorry. That's right. um, ketchup look, is made with tomatoes. Ellie, tomato, look by the front door. The tomato is an undocumented immigrant, um, and by that I mean the tomato originated. That's where your bowl is, because I heard your sister. Your sister has the bowls because she just poured the nerds in there. The tomato is an undocumented immigrant, as one of the authors that I read said. And the reason for that is because it started in the New World. Um, we don't really know how it got its way to Europe. It hopped aboard some Spanish galleon or somebody else's boat, either intentionally or by accident. Um, the Italians, for as much as we connect them with the tomato, didn't start cooking with tomatoes until the um, very late, really middle of the 17th century. Um, and so there's this really interesting backstory of um, classes and races and cultures coming together to make this really interesting barbecue. And then there's this really strong undercurrent of, um, for Christians out there for uh, table theology, for the Eucharist, for communion, for this idea that, that Christianity and the kingdom of God is all about coming around a common table. Um, it's hard to hate people that you have to share a table with, or at least it usually is. And so I think there's something really cool about barbecue and the communal effort it takes to bring all of it together to to, to raise the hogs, to, to cook the hogs, to make the rubs, to make the side dishes, to have this big event where you bring family and friends together and share a common table with people who have different political ideas and different religious ideas and just different ideas about everything. Um, I think there's a lot of really cool, interesting stories there about how that can be done, um, how it is being done. Um, but yeah, it's a, especially with the way our culture is today and, and the way how older, you know, deeply divided our country is, um, you know, I think there's there's some interesting conversations to be had, and and barbecue takes it from just this abstract conversation to some very practical, um, pra practical ways of doing reconciliation um, and justice, and some of these big picture ideas in very simple ways that I think anybody can do. So the idea is to collect all those stories, tell the story of barbecue, kind of teach some techniques and stuff um, along the way, some basic recipes, so that by the end of the book you could actually put on a barbecue for people, you could cook, you could actually do this table fellowship thing together. But that's the idea. Um, as soon as the world starts turning again, um, hopefully I can find a agent and, and pitch it to somebody. Anyway, we're gonna um, dice these. If you've ever diced a tomato, maybe Kim can hold this up. Uh, I'm 
or sorry, an onion. You wanna make sure it's flat, you wanna cut up off the, uh, the top, cut it in half. Then you wanna make sure you've got this outer edge. Yes, sweet pea. Where's my bowl? I don't know, I'll help you look for it in just a second, okay? Mm. Um, and then we're gonna make slices about half an inch thick. Actually, I'm sorry, about a quarter inch thick holding this in place. One really good technique um, to use is to actually put a towel under these because they slip and slide a lot. Um, make sure you got a nice sharp knife. It'll help you a lot. This is a, a shoe knife. It looks pretty. It's not super, super fancy, but it is a little more expensive than what you would get at Walmart. But I clearly have not sharpened it, which is why I'm having a tough time going through. So anyway, we're gonna do three or four horizontal slices and then we're gonna go vertically, just like this. Again, about a quarter of an inch at a time. I'm going nice and slow because again we're not in a rush here we got nowhere to be it's more important that you get this done correctly and don't cut any fingers off than it is that you look like bobby flay anyway so we're going to do nice slice thin slices this is dicing um, if you're going to do this a little bit more we can mince them it doesn't really matter we only need about half a cup of onions and we're going to be using an immersion blender at the end anyway um, so the cooking process is going to make these nice and soft um, and you could actually leave them that way if you wanted to um, but for me i like putting the sauce in a squirt bottle to be able to you know squirt on your sandwich or on your ribs or whatever and i found that if you leave them in there it clogs it up so this is that's actually about three quarters couldn't find my half cup it's about half a cup again we're not baking so it doesn't have to be precise Tuck that thumb, says Alec. Oh, yeah. Is it right here or over here? No, oh, sorry. Uh, what else do we need to do? Oh, I lost my, uh, my note. Amy says hi. And Brett Hammond says, A Meal with Jesus by Tim Chester is awesome. Oh, I'll have to check that one out. A Meal with Jesus. I like the name of that. Okay, so we're going to put two teaspoons. Where did my teaspoon go? I'm really on top of this and well organized. Over here, next to the... Where? Next oh, to the rosemary. thank you. Um, again, we're going to use kosher salt, if I can find the kosher salt, because I'm losing... Oh, I have it. Oh, Kim's using it as a prop. Hey, it was helping me stay steady. No, that's good. I'll get right back. That's gross. Um, we're going to use two, te two teaspoons of kosher salt. Again, um, two teaspoons of kosher salt is not the same thing as two teaspoons of table salt. So if you only have table salt, make sure you Google the substitution um, number there, because I don't know what it is offhand. And you, if you use two teaspoons of table salt instead, it'll be very, very salty. Two teaspoons of chili powder. If you can't tell, I really like chili powder. Um, I like Mexican food a lot. Um, I like the smokiness that this adds without being over the top. Um, if you wanted to add liquid smoke to give a really big smoky flavor, you could do that. Again, this is your sauce. Make it however you want. Um, I like the bite that the pepper gives. It gives a little bit of spice on the back end, but not a lot. Um, you could add actual um, excuse me, peppers to this. Um, like chili peppers or I used to add chipotle peppers and what I would do is I would get um, the can which again is eluding me a can that looks just like this of chipotle peppers that are in adobo sauce I would take out a chipotle pepper take out the inside seeds to try to minimize the spiciness dice it up put it in add a little bit of adobo sauce and I really like it. It adds a nice, again, smoky flavor to complement the chili powder that's already in there. Um, but it can get spicy. A lot of folks don't like food as spicy as I do. The kids wouldn't eat it. The kids wouldn't eat it. My wife wouldn't eat it. Um, and so one day, by complete accident, I thought I grabbed chipotle and chipotle, chipotle peppers in adobo, but I actually got chipotle salsa. Um, and this is just kind of one of those dumb accidents that we found, hey, we really like this. Um, and it's got, you know, a few extra things in there. Um, tomato puree, chipotle peppers, sugar, onion, vinegar, salt, canola oil, paprika, spices, garlic. So it's got a lot of stuff that's already in there, um, but we just found that I liked it. And also it's already minced for me, or pureed rather for me, so there's not as much work that I have to do. It doesn't make as big of a mess. And it wasn't too hot. So what? Wasn't too hot. Wasn't too hot, wasn't too spicy. We legit could not eat the ribs one time. Yeah, they were very spicy. <laughs> um, so, so there's one tablespoon of there, and then what I'm gonna do real quick is I'm gonna um, bring this over here. To our stovetop. I'm going. trying. Um, I'm going to whisk this up because one, obviously, you want to mix things. Um, but we're going to heat this up, and if you don't whisk this immediately, um, all that sugar is sitting at the bottom, and it will burn. Um, so you want to whisk this, and then we're going to bring it up to a boil. I'm going to put this on medium high. Um, you can bring it up to a slow boil if you prefer. I haven't found a big difference um, between bringing up from like a medium uh, low to a medium high. So I'm doing medium high. 
Make sure that everything at the bottom is nice and whisked and not burn, or I'm sorry, not stuck, and you shouldn't have a problem with burning. So anyway, what we're gonna do uh, is uh, bring this to a boil and we are gonna let it simmer down. Basically what we're doing is just letting the sauce thicken up. That's gonna take about 30, 45 minutes. And um, when that's done, I'm gonna take an immersion blender to it to just make sure everything is nice and smooth, that the uh, all those onions are nice and blended. You don't have too many big chunks. Again, if you like chunks, leave it in there, it's your sauce. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna do that for about 30 minutes and I figure you don't wanna sit there and watch uh, barbecue sauce boil for half an hour. So um, we'll take a break here. The ribs are going, they are at, let's see what our temperature is at right now, 246.9, so right right below the 250 mark. So I'm happy with that. Um, our, let's make sure, let's see, are we smoking? Alex wanna know how many quarts are in our saucepan. Um, great question. I, I think, think this is a, is a six, I think it's a six quart pot. Um, I have some really big ones that I use at Christmas time when I jar sauce that are uh, five gallons. They're very large. Though that takes a couple hours if you're doing this, um, you know, for a crowd, if you want to jar your sauce uh, or can your sauce. Canning is really easy. I mean, it does take some space and take some time, um, but it's fun. You know, it's a fun Christmas present to give away to people. Um, but once this comes to a boil, I'm going to let it go for about 30 minutes at a, um, not a real hard boil, um, but I also am not looking for it to simmer. Somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, I'll show you. I'll bring you on right before it's done so I can show you the, the thickness that we're looking for in the sauce and also kind of the boil that we're looking for. Because I, I used to do it at a low simmer, but what you're trying to do is boil off the liquid. And if you do it at a low simmer, that just takes a long time. Um, and if you do it too high, it can burn and it, it, uh, it just doesn't work out as well. So we're going to bring this to a boil, let it go for about 30 minutes, and then check on it again. But and as a plug for our pot, we've had that for 14 years. Oh, yeah. So this is a Cathlon <laughs> uh, stainless steel pot. It never dies. Yeah, it's not a super fancy like high end. We got that for a wedding. And yeah, we've had it uh, for, wow, we've been married for a long time. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, any questions, uh, you know, before we go, um, kind of recap, we looked at, at my setup. We've got that Weber performer out there with the slow and sear insert. We have the Thermoworks thermometer, their smoke version that is going to give us that great temperature. We're cooking about 250. I sometimes will go up to 275 if I'm in a hurry. You don't want to go much higher than that with barbecue. We cooked it like 325 for our turkey, but that's because turkey doesn't cook as long and we wanted to try to crisp the skin up. Um, some people do as low as 225, but there's only so many hours of the day and I have not found any quality difference between 225 and 250. Um, so I go with 225 or 250, honestly, because my two barbecue heroes are uh, Meathead, uh, who runs Amazing Ribs, and then Aaron Franklin. And Meathead likes to run at 225, and Aaron likes to run at 275, and I found 250 was a nice compromise. So we're running at 250, we've got a water pan in there, we've got a rack of baby back ribs, which again come from back here, um, and spare ribs come down here. We're, um, baby back cook a little faster, usually about two to three hours. Um, I usually knock them out in just under three hours in my KBQ, that big box that we use the turkey for. In my Weber, it should go more about three hours because there's not a convection fan in there. Might go a tad earlier, um, which is why you always want to make sure you leave enough room because there's ways to hold the meat. Um, but there's not really ways to make it cook faster. Uh, we've got it going in at 250. We've got a rub on there. Uh, we've got the water pan in there. We're using hickory. Um, we're chugging along. We made a rub. We got our sauce going. It's already starting to come a boil. We're gonna let that simmer. We're gonna do an immersion blender. We're gonna clean, uh, blend it together, and uh, and then we'll put the sauce on at the very, very end. Actually, not at the very end. After it's done cooking. Um, some people will sauce and slather their meat, and you can do that um, if you want. But what you should not do. Um, is put sauce on the barbecue and then put it on top of the direct fire, on top of the grill and try to um, uh, caramelize it that way. You can, but it is very hard and you are almost guaranteed to burn your sauce and that's not super tasty. But I've got a trick for that that I'll show you when we come back. Um, yeah, if there aren't any more questions, our sauce is going, our ribs are rock and rolling, I'm super thirsty and um, yeah, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Awesome. Thank you guys for joining me. Um, like I said, I will be back in about 30 minutes. Um, so let's say, I can't, 3.50-ish. Um, I'll come back on and we will finish up our barbecue sauce. We will check on the ribs and um, yeah, and then we'll take another break right for the ribs are done. I'll show you how to sauce ribs, which is, um, there's a little technique to it more than, than you might think. Um, and uh, how I go about caramelizing sauce. Because you can either do, there's two types of ribs. You can have a dry rub rib, which is where you just have the rub and no sauce. 
or you can do a wet rib, which is where you probably, you have a rub, in, um, you still have the rub, but then you put sauce on the barbecue sauce. Um, and that's more of what a lot of people think of as, as barbecue ribs. Dry rub is a Memphis thing. When I lived there, I grew to love dry rub ribs, but I do like a sauce too, which is why I'm making them. So what I've done is kind of find, again, kind of a happy medium. Um, Again, the thing with barbecue is you can do whatever you like. If you like dry rib, dry rub ribs, do that. If you like it super wet and sloppy, do that. I like it kind of sticky. And so I do a thin coat of barbecue sauce and then I'll caramelize it with what's called a searzol. I'll show you, it's a fun tool. Um, and uh, I get that nice stickiness, but I still get that nice bark from like a dry rub. And then if people want to add more sauce, um, at the end they can, so. Anyway, <laughs> welcome back. Um, we're gonna, the sauce is just about finished. If you want to come bring the camera over here, we'll take a look at it. Um, this is kind of the boil that I'm, I'm looking for. Um, it's, it's not a super, super hot, uh, hard boil. Um, it's pretty close to that, but it's uh, not like just simmering either. It's a little bit higher than that. You can see that the, uh, the sauce is reduced. This is kind of where we started from. Um, and then you can see it's kind of gone down um, layer by layer and reduced by about 40, 50%. That's what we're looking for. Again, this is totally up to you. The sauce is um, edible as is. There's nothing raw or uncooked in there. Um, you could just mix it all together and, and blend it or not blend it and use a barbecue sauce like that. You could just heat it up and use it like that. I like reducing it because I like the sauce a little bit thicker. Um, but again, here you have more room for your own interpretation. You can make it super thick, you can make it super thin. Um, I think it's done when I see it reduced about 50% and when it's got this thickness kind of like um, what I, I, I call like candy. Like if you're cooking candy, if you've ever been to like Gatlinburg or something and see them cook caramel or, or whatnot. It's got that viscousness, viscosity um, that, that I'm looking for. So I'm going to turn off the heat, make sure that it's nice and well mixed. And I'll usually let it cool down a little bit just so that it's uh, a little bit easier to handle and it's not super, super hot. Um, but for the sake of Facebook Live, we'll go ahead and blend it. I use this uh, KitchenAid immersion blender. Immersion, immersion uh, blender. I uh, I like it. It's inexpensive, but it's it's pretty heavy duty. Uh, it's not like commercial grade, but it's close and it's uh, not super expensive. Plus, it comes apart in two pieces, so this is com you can completely wash this. I think you can even put it in the dishwasher. Um, this is obviously the motor. Don't do that; it will break. Um, we're gonna put this in here, and it's got two settings. I start off. Uh, with lower one setting and you're going to immerse the blender part. You have to be careful if you let this go up too much it'll start splattering. Um, but I'm going to just kind of go around in slow circles. I'm just going to do this a little bit. I'll come back later after the video. I like to tilt it just to make sure it stays a little deeper um, so it doesn't uh, come out by accident. And you'll see it start blending. You'll see those onions that will come in there and it'll start mixing. I like to move it around just to make sure that because you'll get onions that will you know stick to the sides, stick to the bottom. I like to make sure I get all of those just so that when I put it into a condiment bottle later, um, they don't clog up the bottle. And so I'll spend a good five, maybe even 10 minutes, depending on you know how much sauce I'm making, um, getting this nice, nice and blended. Um, I'll go through once, like I said, on the one, then I like to turn it up a little bit. Move it around, make sure that I've got everything. Make sure that I get those onions that are on the sides. You know, and again, this is totally up to you. I like it nice and super blended. I'm all those onions completely pureed. When you pull it out, if you find some more, you can do it again. Like I said, I'm gonna come back and finish that. I just wanna give you guys an idea of how to do that. Um, yeah, it's ready to go. I like it. It's gonna make your house smell super vinegary, but that's okay. It tastes pretty good. I think it tastes pretty good. We're gonna go check on the ribs real quick. They should be rock and roll up. Right now, temperature is a little bit lower um, than what I want. So like 245, I'd like to boost it up a couple degrees. But that's not something that's worth um, messing with. Now, if you notice, there's not a whole bunch of smoke uh, billowing out of there. That's okay. It's really hard to see on camera, but there's this really thin, almost invisible smoke that's coming out. Um, that's, that's, that's good. Um, it's actually great. Um, because it's still adding flavor. There's not a lot of additives. It smells nice and sweet. Um, you can get a little bit more, a little bit more blue hue in. Um, honestly, the reason that it's not doing it as much is because the, um, the wood's not sitting down quite as deep as it really should because it's a little too big. But you're still getting smoke. It's invisible smoke, which is really uh, clean, pure smoke. 
coming out of here and that's perfect that's really what we want like i said we could go a little bit heavier with a little bit blue smoke um, but if you're getting a whole bunch of white smoke it's really easy to over smoke your meat we're just going to take a look at this just for the sake of cooking normally i wouldn't really open this unless i needed to add more charcoal um, and if you do have to add more charcoal so like let's say you're doing a longer cook like we'll do tomorrow and i'll show you guys how to do this you want to try to burn the charcoal first um, get it lit before you put it in there that'll minimize the extra smoke that you're putting on there um, and it also lets you know um, how hot it is and you don't have to go up and down as much so anyway i'm just going to take a look at this and what i'm going to do um, is squirt the meat with this squirt bottle all this is is water in here you can use uh, vinegar you could use beer you could use whatever you want um, it's going to add a little bit of flavor if you use like vinegar or beer or something like that um, but all i'm really doing is two things one spraying off any ash so i can see the color um, of the meat if we're getting a nice dark red mahogany color that we want for the bark um, and then also when as i add the water it's going to moisten that uh, surface it's going to keep the moist the the meat um, a little moist but also that that water is going to hold on to that smoke and give us a little bit more smoky flavor which hopefully will give us a little bit better smoke ring so let's take a peek at it again we're gonna open this up straight up and down so we don't lose that heat yeah look at that it's looking good we've got a nice red color not too ashy we got some smoke we're beeping a little bit that's okay that's because uh, when we lifted that up it went down between our 220 or below our 220 gauge anyway it's um almost four o'clock which means the ribs have been on there for about about an hour or so um they're gonna just sit where they are uh, there's not really anything to do at this point in the cook you're just kind of maintaining the temperature you want to keep an eye on your thermometer make sure you're hitting you know right around that 250 mark um, make sure you know your cold bed hasn't you know burned through which it shouldn't for a cook like this if you fill up a uh, a slow and sear basket or kind of any basket um, with charcoal that should be enough for a three hour cook usually um, but yeah so right now we're just going to maintain temperature and I'll come back and check in a couple hours and uh, it should be done I'll show you what to look for when it's done it's ribs so we're going to go ahead and take these ribs off I'm going to turn you guys around before Kim comes out here and helps me um, if you'll notice the temperature is actually a little high um, I was shooting for about 250 and it got a little warmer because um, the coals were all burned down they eventually caught up together and uh, burned up but you know what hey it's not the end of the world if this ever happens, um, I used to panic when I was first doing this and I get cups of water and pour it on and couldn't figure out how to uh, get the temperature down. You just want to do it slowly. Again, this is your gas down here um, and this is your brake normally, but this is going to control um, your temperature most of the time. But you don't want to do both of these at the same time because if you do, then you're pushing the gas and the brake at the same time. But if you'll notice, this one's all the way closed and the temperature was still running. So what I did was turn the fence uh, a little bit more closed up here on top. You don't want to close these all the way, you'll completely smother the fire and you'll get too much smoke build up in there and it'll get a little um, acrid uh, taste to your ribs. So um, we closed these just a little bit. It was enough to take the temperature down and it went down nice and slow. It's gonna take a little bit of time if you're up at like 275 or 280. Um, it's gonna take a few minutes to get back down to that 250 and that's okay. Um, these are ribs. They're not super, super finicky like brisket is, but you do wanna keep that consistent temperature. Anyway, let's go ahead and take these off. I checked them a little bit earlier and they look pretty close to done. Um, these might need um, an extra minute or so, but um, sun's going down and uh, I'm hungry. So let's eat. So let's take this off and see how we did. I'd say those look pretty good. Hold on one second. So when you're cooking, you're looking for, hey, that's a better angle, sorry. I can't multitask. We're gonna take our little thermometer off. That is a little hot, so uh, I just don't have feelings left. But this is a pretty good um, look for our ribs. We've got a nice mahogany red color. They're actually a little bit darker in person than they look um, on screen. And then we are, what we're looking for really are two things. We want a little bit um, of the bones. It's called pullback. And so we want the, the uh, meat to be pulling back from those bones, ideally a little bit more than it is here. Um, but again, it's getting dark and I don't want to stand around. Oh, here's my tongs. But the other way that you can check for doneness, get a nice, really long pair of tongs. If you're ever grilling, you should have a really long pair of tongs. Because um, if you got short ones, your hands are going to be close to the fire, and that's no good. This gives you a lot of space. The other thing that you're looking for when you're you're doing ribs is what's called the bend test. And so you want to see if you get a nice bend in the middle. You can see it like that. You want to hold it kind of about halfway and see if it bends. And you want to see a little bit of a crack. You can see kind of that coming in the bark. The bark is the uh, the harder outside. Again, if you can tell these, uh, the only thing about ribs is probably could use another maybe 30 minutes or so. These are a little bit thicker baby backs, but um, like I said, that's okay. This is actually a little bit of personal preference. If you are um, 
uh, cooking in a competition. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take this bad boy off. It's only burning on one side, so it's okay to touch. If you're cooking in a competition, um, the way these uh, ribs are considered done um, is not the fall off the bone kind of thing that you see at Chili's and other places. A lot of times if you're at a restaurant and the ribs just fall off the bone, especially if it's not a barbecue restaurant, then those ribs have uh, been steamed, um, certainly not smoked. Um, you want a, a rib ideally that actually has a little chew so that if you take a bite, oh, we're getting the barbecue sauce. If it has a little, um, if you take a bite out of it, you can still see the, the semicircle from your mouth. Um, and so that's, that's that's what we're looking for. That's what I'm looking for in a rib. If you like it more overdone, again, like we said before, this is barbecue. It's up to you and however you want to cook it, however you want to make it. Um, as for flavoring too, I was actually just watching this barbecue competition show and they go through a lot of steps where they wrap it and they put all kinds of extra seasonings and sugar and butter and all kinds of stuff uh, in the aluminum foil and they wrap it. Um, two things to keep in there, uh, mind there. Uh, well, actually, really just one big thing. You don't want to make barbecue at home like you would make in a competition. Um, they're trying to pack as much flavor and tenderness and moisture into one bite that they possibly can. If you cooked ribs at home like they do at a competition, it would just be overwhelming because you would be getting – uh, maximum flavor um, overload and bite after bite after bite and it just really wouldn't be enjoyable um, and then there's not really a purpose in wrapping the ribs at home in the competition they do it because every little bit counts and every little bit helps you win the competition um, we're not competing with anybody we're just making dinner so anyway so here are our ribs um, as you notice there's no sauce on them yet um, we made a sauce earlier if you missed that check out the video I've got the recipe on there for my guava barbecue sauce um, you can leave it now, and this is perfectly done. If you lived in Memphis, they would take the ribs off now, and then they would toss uh, some rub on there, and that would be Memphis dry rub ribs. Um, we're going to do a little bit of sauce, but only just a little. I'm not going to sauce the underside of the ribs. Um, I just don't really see a point in it. You're not losing out on much flavor. You're going to get plenty of sauce on top, um, and it keeps your fingers a little dry. Um, plus, if you turn it over to to uh, to to sauce the bottom you can end up messing up some of that nice bark that we've been working on on the top and the, you know it's just not worth the uh the risk the the reward is not enough of a payoff so what we're going to do is sauce i've got my sauce right here in a nice handy um what's this thing called a bowl i know words i have all the best words um but we got our sauce here in a bowl again this is why i like the table setup in the weber performer because if you just bought a weber kettle by itself you wouldn't have um this uh table to set your bowl on of course you're probably not live streaming your barbecue so it may not matter anyway i like this i've got a nice um silicone brush here you can get these anywhere some of them just have regular brushes like a paint brush i like the silicone ones just because they wash a little bit better um what's up kevin in alabama kevin we've got alabama tennessee florida new jersey we're going we're going nationwide with this thing anyway um so with sauce i like to do a really nice thin coat of sauce um because um, with barbecue, I do want you to taste the rub that I made. I want you to taste the sauce, but I also really want you to taste the meat um, because that's the beauty of barbecue is that 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 marriage of smoke and meat that is so unique uh, in food. And if we just smother this thing in sauce and smother it in rub, you're not going to get to taste the meat. And maybe that's your thing. If that's what you like, more power to you. Um, but we put a lot of effort into making this meat as good as possible. So I'd, I don't want to overpower that. So I'm going to take my brush. I'm going to start at this far end. I'm going to make sure that I get every little top and side that I can. You can glop and slop this. There's not a, you know, a super perfect technique, however you want to do this. Like I said, I'm doing a thin coat, and I'm going to do a thin coat all over, and then we're going to caramelize the sugar um, in this, but we're not going to do it over those charcoals over there, um, partly because they have not burned down evenly, so you wouldn't get um, an even... Uh, caramelization or an even heat um, partly because it would be a huge pain in the butt and a mess to try to pick up a whole rack of ribs and and flip it over but mostly because it would burn our sauce really really fast there's a lot of rub there's a lot of sugar in the rub there is a lot of sugar in this sauce and while caramelizing sugar can be a really great thing that's how we get caramel or caramel or however you decide the lord wants you to pronounce that word um, but it also sugar also burns really really fast so we're going to do a nice thin coating of this sauce and if you're over at my house sometime and you're eating i'll have sauce out on the side and you can um add more if you want but that is slightly offensive because it means the meat's not good enough kevin asked if you can find some fruit wood tree trimmings this spring they make great smoke for ribs absolutely 
um, apple, peach, pear, um, whatever you really have uh, in your area of, of the world. Um, just like I use guava in sauce, guava wood um, is used in like places like Hawaii. If you're in the Northwest, there's a wood called alderwood that is very popular, especially it's a very light smoke and it's really good with uh, fish or poultry. Let's see. I'm using hickory today, or we did use hickory today because that's what we've got. I like apple. Cherry is really good on this stuff too. Um, there's not a massive difference. The only difference you get into is really with mesquite. Mesquite burns really hot, and uh, it adds very distinct flavor, and so you can over-smoke stuff. All right, so we've got this nice pretty rack of ribs. Um, that's going on and we could take it off again and it would be fine you'd have a nice wet rack of ribs but i like to play with fire um this is called a sears all um it is a propane tank that you would get at target or at bass pro shop or academy really anywhere walmart sells these things it's just your basic coleman propane tank then we have this benzomatic or burnzomatic sorry attachment that you would pick up at lowe's this is the ts 4000 and the model actually does matter um, with this thing at the top this top part is the actual sears all and um, it is designed specifically for the burnzo uh, Burnsomatic TS4000. And essentially what we're going to do here is a, um, what's that dessert? Oh, I got my wife here now. Here, you want to help me? Here, we'll turn you around. Hold on. Oh, come on, person. There we go. There we go. Um, creme brulee. Creme brulee, that's what. I love creme brulee. This is essentially what we're doing. That's the same kind of technique where you would take a propane torch um, and you would caramelize the sugar on top of a creme brulee. We're gonna do this, um, put on a bigger scale uh, with this. This is great too if you wanna sear just steaks or anything else that you've gotten up to temperature but you don't wanna put back on a grill because the reality is that grill is um, super hot all over the place and this concentrates that heat in a really small area. Um, we're gonna give this about just a minute to, to warm up. But this gets very, very hot. You don't wanna touch it. Um, but it's gonna do, uh, do that nice caramelization with this in a nice, even way. Um, now this is this does take a little bit of skill um, because especially if this is on longer if you get a darker bar, uh, bark if your bark is almost black and then you put the sauce on it it's going to be really hard um, to tell whether or not you're burning so what you're looking for are bubbles um, once it starts bubbling up like our sauce was inside when we were making it earlier that tells us that it's got that nice caramelization it doesn't need to be perfect we just don't want it to turn black so what we're going to do um, we're not going to wave. You see people use this technique where you wave back and forth. And the idea there is to try to make sure it's even and you don't burn um, by staying in one place too long. What we're going to do is, is going to stay in one place, but we're just going to make sure we don't burn it. So we'll see if we can get some of the, uh, the bubbles. If you can see, there's little tiny bubbles that are forming. I don't know if you guys can catch that. You can? Great. So as soon as those, those, start boil, uh, those little bubbles start forming, that tells us that the, uh, the liquid's boiling, obviously, but the sugars in the sauce are caramelizing them the way that we want. We don't want to stay on this too long. We're just going to stay on it long enough to get that bubble going, but not so long that it actually burns the sauce. We're not trying to char these ribs. Some people will try to do that. If that's your thing, cool. Um, but I just want a nice, what I call a sticky rib. And this gives that caramelization that you're looking for if you're trying to, you know, toss these over the grill. But it gives it a nice, even way. And you get to play with fun tools and fire, which are always, always a good time. This doesn't take too long. Like I said, we're not going back and forth sweeping. We're just staying in one spot until it starts bubbling. And then we're done. I'm gonna just look over this one more time. Like I said, this does take a little bit of skill, but not too much. If I can do it, anybody can do it. We went over there just twice. We're going to turn that off because it's super, super loud. Put this down. Kim's getting some awesome barbecue shots for us. And now we're going to take it off. Um, there are a couple different ways you could do this. I have these things called meat claws that we're going to show you guys tomorrow. They look like actual claws off a of bear. They're really great for pulling pork. We're going to use that tomorrow. Today, we're just going to use these really long tongs that we showed you guys earlier and put them on our oversized 
uh, board. Now you want, when you're grabbing this off the uh, smoker or off your grill, off whatever, um, you want to be a little bit careful with it. Um, you don't want to take it from the end because if they're, especially if they're super tender and you pull them up here, they're going to fall apart, uh, which sounds cool, but it's not when you're trying to, to serve dinner. Um, you want to get these things about three quarters of the way and you don't want to squeeze this as hard as you can. You want to let that bottom tong do most of the work because you've got this nice pretty bark on top. And if you squeeze that right now, it is going to smash that and you're going to have this big scar and it's just going to look pretty. So we're really using the bottom of this tong. Um, as 95% of it, maybe even 100, if we can do it nice and slowly. There we go. We got our ribs off, we didn't screw up the top, and who cares about the bottom, because nobody can see it anyway. All right, let's take these inside, and we are going to cook them. Um, if you're closing up your grill, this is nice and easy. You don't have to worry about anything inside, if you just put the top on. Close your vents up top. We have our vent closed down here. That'll smother the fire, put it out, everybody's happy. All right, let's go inside and cut these out. First and most importantly, if you're going to make barbecue, you want to make sure you Instagram it because I know it's your phone, but I can't take a picture with mine. Because what's the point of making beautiful, delicious barbecue if you can't share it with the world? This is going to be ugly because it's on a uh, white background, but... Mm -hmm. Penny's asking me what the sides look like. I'm not sure if you're asking the sides of the oh, ribs like the or sides. the sides that we're eating with it. Because we're having corn and salad. Yeah, we're not doing anything Nothing fancy. Nothing fancy. Um, so I got my black gloves on, um, partly because I think they make me look cool. But mostly because they just keep my hands from being super sticky. And they keep the coronavirus off of my ribs. Um, you can slice <laughs> these uh, with just any old sharp knife. Um, I bought this fun toy. Uh, it's a, just a cheap $15 Black & Decker um, what you, carving knife. It's one of those automatic knives. And what's nice about it is it gives you a nice even cut. It's as, is this overkill? Absolutely. You don't need this. But I found that it cuts ribs really easily, even bet, a lot better than I can do uh, by hand. And especially when I, so I make a lot of bacon at home. If you're following this, you probably knew that. And it's hard to keep a nice even slice without having one of those fancy deli slicers you see at the grocery store. Um, this helps me keep a nice even slice because um, it goes through faster and it's just wonderful. They're great for brisket too. Brisket you know, can be tricky to, to carve evenly. But I found that I like this really well because it just slices perfectly, helps me stay straight between the bones. So what you want to do um, is find the bones. Now, if you've got a nice dry rub, you can flip this over and you can cut it that way because you can see the bones um, a little more easily. But I want to try to preserve this bark for a little bit longer. Um, you can cut this up a couple ways. If you're hungry, you can just not cut it up at all. Um, and you can just take this one by one. Um, if you are, um, are sharing with a, just a friend, you can slice this thing in half and go at it. One thing that I see at barbecue restaurants that I like um, is even if you're taking the whole rack yourself, um, they will go ahead and kind of pre-cut it for you and they will slice it in between the bones about three quarters of the way. That helps you pull it apart because the reality is if it's a well-cooked rib, it's not gonna just fall apart. Um, it's gonna have a little pull, a little tug. Um, that's what you want. When I'm serving these ribs at home um, for family or friends, I like to cook, especially but especially for friends, I will cut these up as individual ribs. They make it a lot easier to handle. Um, they tend to go a little bit further because people, uh, it looks like you have more on your plate when they're kind of stacked that way. Um, but they're just easier to handle, easier to eat. And um, ultimately, you know, I want people to be happy when they're cooking. So what we're going to do is look for these bones. You can see them here. There's about a dozen um, or so there, depending on how many or how big the rack was that the book butcher decided to cut. We're just gonna to try to find the space in between the bones, obviously, and um, you can do it a couple different ways. You could do it flat. I have found that it's nice to set this thing up on the side so you can see where those bones are. And then you can just follow the lines in between and let the, the knife do the work. And we have our first rib. Let's take a look at that. Look at that smoke ring. I'm very proud of that smoke ring. Um, that pink is the color you get from sodium nitrate mixing uh, with the meat, and that's what gives you that beautiful smoke ring. Um, however, it, even though it's something that, that barbecue folks pride ourselves on and you want to get and looks really cool, um, you can still have that same smoke flavor without having that smoke ring. So if you don't get it, don't worry about it. You can still have a nice flavor. But one way to kind of help ensure yourself that you get it 
um, is by having a beeper going off behind you. It's all That's the way our, over on the couch. Uh, who cares? Okay. Um, but one way to kind of help your chances of getting that nice smoke ring is to make sure, like we said before, that you put the ribs on a little wet or tacky uh, and then spritz them a couple times during cooking. You don't need to do it every 30 minutes. Maybe do it once an hour. Um, but that wet water, that wet surface is going to hold on the mole hold on to the molecules and the smoke better, and so that's going to help create that smoke ring. If this just stays dry the entire time, um, those uh, that smoke's going to go right off. Kevin says, "Perfect smoke ring, well done." Thank you. Let's cut these up a little bit more. Like I said, carbon mic just does all the work for you, and it slices through them like butter. I'm a big fan. All right, now the most important part of this task is the taste test. If we have done this right, then these ribs should have some bite to them. Now, if you look at them, they're, they're nice and moist. Hopefully you can see the, the moisture, the fat that's still in there um, that's glistening. That means our, our ribs is not too dried out. Like I said, we've got the nice smoke ring. We also have a nice bark on here that's also been caramelized. Uh, so this should be nice and good. But if you look, um, it's not falling apart. It's not super striated um, like you would see like in a pot roast. Um, it's still kind of a solid muscle. Let's taste these and see if they actually work out. Um, <laughs> what we're looking for is I'm not going to live stream you eating the whole dinner though. I'm not. Okay, great. Um, to be able to bite into the rib without it falling off. So you still can see the bite mark, which isn't super appetizing, but you want to be able to bite into it. Matthew Paul Turner says, how many times are you going to go? <laughs> good. We'll be able to take a bite out of it and, um, Make sure that it's nice and tasty. But anyway, with ribs, the way you know that they're really done is once you start eating them. You could have them overcooked and just pull apart and fall apart and slide the bone right out if that's your thing. Um, but this is really what we're looking for is, is to be able to bite into it. It's nice and soft and tender and moist or juicy, which is a much better word. But it doesn't just fall off the bone while you're eating it. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions before we go? Because these are nice, hot, fresh ribs and they taste really good. They want to know if you're a pig murderer. A pig murderer. Um, I consider myself more of a pig serial killer. It's not random. It's intentional. Um, I have particular targets, victims, if you will, um, in the in the pig community. I don't want to just kill any pig. I prefer one that's that's fatty and flavorful. Happy. Happy too. Mm -hmm. Happy pigs, happy cows make happy meat. If a cow only has one bad day, that brisket's going to taste a lot better. I can't. There is actual science behind that. It has to do with the shock and the fear and other sorts of things and uh, shooting chemicals into the muscles. Um, but yeah, happy animals that lead happy, peaceful lives um, make better meat. My wife's yelling because she wants to eat. I want to eat. I want to turn off that stupid alarm. I hope this has been helpful. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, if you have any more questions, you know, leave them for me. Email them. I'd be happy to ask them.